as always, we're playing a Canadian short in front of this feature, and tonight the filmmaker is here. We're playing a film called A Dark Bedtime. Please welcome Paul Ayosh. You have someone with you. Do you want to introduce yes. him and say a few words about the film? Sure. This is uh, Colin Sharp. Um, he's one of the actors in the film, uh, along with uh, uh, another actor uh, named Nadine Bujuric, but she can't be here today because she's uh, performing on the main stage at Second City right now. That's fair. Yeah. So. <laughs> I don't know how much you want to give away about the show. Do you want um, to just say a few words? Yeah. About it? Uh, uh, thank you all for coming, by the way. Um, Really appreciate that. Um, I'm not sure how much we should say about the film because it is pretty short. Um, but uh, we, um, uh, yeah, we just appreciate you guys being here and supporting short films, and we're very excited to see uh, Endless after this. So, yeah. Right. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Uh, the filmmakers of the Endless are here. You may be familiar with them. Welcome to the stage, Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead, the writer, director, stars, the masterful filmmakers of the Emirates. Uh, we want to keep this really brief so we can have a lively Q&A and, and all that, but um, just very sincerely, I uh, want to make this less of an introduction and just more of a thank you to all of you guys and thank you to everyone at Toronto After Dark. Uh, the, the reward for what we do, it's all of you guys showing up and watching it. And that probably sounds like bullshit things you say in an introduction at a film festival, but sincerely from the bottom of our hearts. Um, it is, uh, it truly is the reward, and I don't, most of you probably, I heard a lot of cheers when we said our first movie in 2012. Anywhere we go in the world, most people have never seen our movies, uh, particularly our first movie. You know, it's, it's, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny little movie. Uh, we love it very much. We were flattered when everyone showed up then. We were blown away, and we're blown away, just as blown away right now. Uh, we made a second movie that premiered at TIFF called Spring, and... Uh, and the, those are the 10 people that saw that one too. Uh, low hanging fruit joke. The, the point is, is we make these like really low budget, tiny movies, and we've been privileged enough to make three very personal movies that we've had full control over because they're very, very, very low budget. And, and we keep the budget down by being really self-aligned. Well, we work with really amazing people. Um, we also, we just, do a lot of jobs on set. Uh, write, direct, visual effects, cinematography, editing. Uh, and in this one, um, we, we also perform it. And we're performing as people that are very, very, very different than who we are in real life. Um, and I would say one of the biggest differences between them and us in real life is that we spend a shameful amount of time on social networking. But uh, as he said before, um, the people that you're about to see, they look a lot like us, so we hope you like them okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, we've been traveling uh, with the film for a little bit now, and, uh, and I'm sorry if we seem any, in any way jet lagged because uh, Justin booked our tickets here, and in his infinite wisdom, booked a, uh, a red eye over here, so we're a little fucked up. Um, but, uh, but thank you, it's, it's actually pretty awesome to to see a, a, a completely full theater. Um, that's, and, and, and you guys probably think that you're doing yourselves a favor in some way, like, oh, I get to go see like, a, a cool movie tonight. You know, it's like, a, it's like an activity. Um, but you actually need to recognize and truly, truly do this, that you're doing something really important. Um, because there's, there's, uh, there's kind of a war going on between movies that try to be interesting and movies that try to be safe and boring. And, uh, and everything playing at Toronto After Dark is like trying very, very hard to do something you haven't seen before. And you guys are actually contributing to like the, the war against uh, shitty movies. Thank you very much for being here. You're actually doing something important. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I'm not just pandering to an audience. 
I mean that from the bottom of my heart. It's so th thrilling to see a full movie theater in, you know, in Toronto. I mean, this is so cool. I went and I saw The Master in Arclight on a Tuesday evening, and it was empty. It was just the two of us and one other crazy guy. <laughs> and we see a full movie theater for an independent film with no stars in it. So that's, that's so fucking cool what you guys are doing tonight. Um, but as he said, we're going to keep it short, which I've already completely not done. I did it too. I went way long. Oh, shit. All right. Uh, well, um, please enjoy the short before this. Um, and, uh, and what? I just realized something. This is a basically being here. All of you, you may be uncomfortable with this, but you're basically like our cinema family. Yeah. I literally just came out and like, jumped into man's like, fuck, that's like true. I'm sorry, that's corny. Okay, we're going to do it. <laughs> Wondering if after your first film resolution you just had all of these ideas, but you thought, well, we gotta scale it back and just focus on something, or was it a reaction to after you did Spring and that did so well uh, to Tiff and you just thought I wanted to scale back, or was it purely I want to do and I consider this more of sort of an elegant sci-fi film that happens to have sort of like the trappings of a horror film. Did you just want to do something like that and then you thought, oh, I can roll resolution back into it. Yeah. So, and, and actually, I guess I should clarify for anyone who doesn't know, this movie in one weird, well, many, many, but, but one very particular weird way plugs into resolution. Like the, our first movie crosses paths with this movie. The guys in the cabin, um, yeah. Uh, where one was chained up and he burned it down. Um, there's a whole movie about those guys called Resolution. So. <laughs> yes, go go find it. It is it is fantastic. And um, uh, but the reason that we actually chose to make this is after spring, um, every door was open and and we we're working on much larger projects and still are. Um, but we started realizing that. Um, we were kind of just professionally taking meetings and returning emails, and we weren't like making movies. And those projects, they just take a lot longer. That's just what they do. And, uh, and so we decided that instead of, we, I mean, we can still answer emails and, uh, and stuff like that while we're making a movie. So, um, so we decided to just make something that is completely self-reliant, a bit like our first movie, where we just do as much as we possibly can so that nobody can stop us. So we saved some money, and we luckily ended up getting a, uh, it was still a small budget, but we got, we got uh, regular financing, but we in intended to finance it ourselves. We literally practiced like holding the camera and like doing, like no joke, we actually tried it just to see if it was possible. And, um, and it turned into like an actual independent production. But in many ways, it was just kind of a response to uh, the fact that, um, you know, we, we are filmmakers, and it was kind of like a middle finger in a way of just like, I don't want to wait anymore, and uh, we went off and, and made a movie. But you're also actors in the film, and I wonder, was that also, and then it, like, was the idea to return to that scene from Resolution, where you guys cameo and reverse engineer that? I, I do know that you had plans to do something with those camper Katie characters initially. It was a very oh. different project. Yeah, yeah. Well, for one, we had a really terrible improvisational movie Aaron tried to make. Aaron and I tried to make on the film <laughs> festival circuit. Aaron tried to make. I didn't have nothing to do with it. I, I don't even found someone that looked like me. If you ever see the footage, that's not really me. Um, it's, it's my cousin. He looks exactly like me. Uh, no, we made a terrible, terrible, started to make a really terrible improvisational movie about uh, these two UFO cult members who uh, the cold left them behind, and they were on the world trying to find like a UFO pickup spot. It's fuck. It's as bad as it sounds, but but um, but uh, and it wasn't our next movie. It was like let's just shoot something while we're on the road. We eventually abandoned it, but thought, well, there's something kind of cool there about these guys and some of this mythology we had developed. But then, in terms of the quote unquote resolution scene to begin with, that the, it, it's a weird thing where this movie exists entirely on its own. Resolution exists entirely on its own. There is perfect continuity in a thousand different ways between the two, but that was more about setting up creative parameters for ourselves. It was, for whatever reason, inspiration can come from anywhere, and in this case, it came from a movie that, our first movie that nobody saw, and nobody probably will see, uh, a tiny, tiny little film, and we just kept talking about what happened to those characters, and 
and small little subplots for like five years and eventually came up with this story that we very carefully engineered at script phase and in edits, giving it to people that, that had never, knew, didn't know anything about the movies we made, which is pretty easy to find, uh, and, and uh, to make sure there was the same level of comprehension. But there is a weird thing where you have seen our previous work, you see all these weird crossover times, and there's like an, another type of satisfaction to it. Now, I, before I throw to the audience too, I wanted to ask, you mentioned the mythology that you developed for this film. What's great about the movie is how much is left unsaid, but how much is teased. Uh, how much uh, did you put down to paper and sort of can, you know, plot out in terms of what exactly is, is going on? And perhaps you could shed, I don't want you to shed light on all of it, but some light on these sort of totems that appear in that final montage before the sure. end of the movie, which are really great. I would love to hear about how they're yeah. designed and what the ideas behind them were. Yeah, the, um, so as far as like what's put to paper, the entire mythology, whether or not it's physically on paper, is, is a completely understood by the two of us thing. We could, if you got us really drunk, we could explain every <laughs> fucking thing that happened. But we kind of, um, there's, there's a difference between our films and say like, well, there's many differences between our films and like a David Lynch movie. His are great. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, the difference is um, uh, he, his, his work on like dream logic and interpretation, ours actually have a real definite answer, but you have to search for them. But the thing is, is we prefer to leave a lot of things, just like a clue in the movie that you, you, can, you can unearth it if you want to, but kind of like Hal says in the movie, where it's like, if I just tell you, you're not gonna believe me, you have to go find it. So that's the thing is, and ours is J.J. Abrams, not to quote, you know, but like, you know, he says something about the mystery box, where it's only, it's only fun when it's in the box, right? But, it, but I can tell you, they're all there. They're in the movie, but, it's, but they're, they're teased. Um, and then, what was the second part again? Sorry. About the, the totems. The oh, the totems, totems. yeah. yeah. Um, so two of those are real. I'm sorry, two of those are fake, and one of them is real. There's an actual dragon in the middle of the desert we went to go find. And, um, and then uh, the idea is that this mythology is extraordinarily old, and so a lot of other cultures, even in uh, Southern California, would have created their own interpretations of it. And the interpretation of the great it of the movie is all over the place. You know, the, in that montage, there's of course this kind of totem pole-esque thing that is actually sitting on my shelf. It's about this tall. It's did a you design miniature. it? Or did you no, it? we talked to our designer about it who made it. Um, and the same thing with the, uh, the, the monolith, which is, again, maybe a little shorter, but, uh, but it's real, which is kind of cool to hold in your hand. Um, and, uh, but that's the idea, is that many different interpretations have existed. Lizzie's drawings are another interpretation. Um, I'm blanking, but there's about three or four more throughout the movie of like ways that people try to like put a face on it without actually having seen anything. Yeah, let's see who has a question. Uh, let's go there. I can see you. Oh, that's always fun. Um, the images that you did uh, with the brothers in the lake, and then the shadow image that was up. How did you manage that? How did you produce that? Uh, the question was Steve. Uh, the question was about the lake sequence and how do you achieve these special effects in that sequence, particularly the shadow in the lake. At the offices of Moorhead and Benson, uh, Aaron Moorhead is the visual effects genius, so I will hand over the mic from him. Um, I mean, honestly, on the day, it was really hard to get a monster big enough in the lake. You know, it was very expensive. Um, it took a lot of, like, wranglers to, you know, to make a Rorschach monster appear. Uh, no, I, I, to be honest, there's, uh, it was a very multi-layered thing that involves um, ink blots and uh, tortoise shells, albino tortoise shells, and stuff like that. But it's just a, it's just a big, multi, multi-layered visual effect um, that uh, me and another guy managed. Is that is that a satisfactory answer? I'm sorry to kind of yeah, be like, uh, and it's a visual effect, you know. Okay, so it's a visual effect, but <laughs> yes, also um, the overlying shot. Right. Did you what? Did it? Yeah, yeah, that was really fun um, because we can't hear anything that anyone's doing, so there's just this loud drone hanging above, and then once it starts taking off into the air, we know to like start paddling as fast as we can, you know. But there's no way to communicate because everything's just so loud with the the thing above us. Um, but yeah, it was just a it was a little toy drone. Other questions? 
Right there. Uh, first, really fucking rad movie. <laughs> Second, um, could you talk about some of the media that inspired you to make it? What were some of the influences on the film? Yeah, uh, we got your own work. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, uh, Aaron and I, as much as we, we, we love films, uh, the, the primary influences in most of the movies we've made, uh, as pretentious as it sounds, they most have been literary. And I think in this movie, the main inspirations were uh, books by Alan Moore, books by Alan Gaiman, and Stephen King. And, uh, and specifically, oddly enough, no one ever talks about Stephen King's desperation. There's some, like, like th that, that book definitely uh, inspired a few things about the, uh, the sort of like haunted geolo uh, geology of the camp and sort of like something primordial and you know so old you can never understand it in, in the earth. Those, they, they won't reference this hoodoo once, but like those, those weird, they look like Gandalf's staff, yeah. those like weird things coming there. So that, that kind of stuff. Um, did I cover everything? Was that all our inspirations? Oh shit, we got one more. <laughs> well, it, it's a little different than because you're saying the kind of media that inspired it, but. Um, you guys know the, the Heaven's Gate cult, of course, like we play off of that a lot. Uh, and if you don't, the Heaven's Gate cult is an infamous 1990s, early 90s cult um, that all committed mass suicide. And the movie plays off of that idea in that they actually made videotapes of themselves kind of talking, frankly, kind of like crazy talk before they, they all took their own lives. And they would send it to people like what we received in the beginning of the movie. Um, but actually, also interestingly, there is a website um, for them, still to this day, up and maintained, but it looks like that 1990s kind of website with like a background with like animated GIFs and like bright green on black text and stuff like that. It's, it's really wild um, to take a look at, but those sorts of ideas were something we were playing off of, even though the movie ultimately isn't really about cults at all, it was something that, that was like a little piece that we would take from. Other questions? Yeah, sorry. As, as far as being in front of the camera, as well as um, working from a directorial and, and a cinematography standpoint, what were the, kind of the challenges of doing that, and is that something you would want to do again, or just kind of avoid, as, just to avoid the challenge of it? <coughs> Acting in front of the camera again. Yeah, we, we both very, very sincerely love to and enjoy doing it, and the, this is weird and probably hard to believe, but uh, Acting in a movie you're directing is actually slightly easier than just directing in some ways. If you had that, we had the luxury of the time to prepare for months. Him and I rehearsed together for months before we got to set. So when we got to set, um, you know, you're in a scene and 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 you're performing it. You're feeling everything, but you're also observing the other performers so close up that you're like literally closer to them. And and, and there's something about being in a scene and in that mind state where your adjustments are just quicker and more precise with the other performers. And, and yeah, it's, it's a really enjoyable thing. I think uh, Aaron had it way harder than me because the beautiful cinematography in the film is by him. So there's like just, and it rarely happened. There was like occasion, there was like once where it was like late and you know, it's like doing organic chemistry. He's looking at a monitor of himself, trying to light himself while he's adjusting light. And that's, that's really hard. But just acting and directing is kind of easier in some ways. Again, if you've had the time to prepare. There was a question right over there. I think. Yes, you. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that you have a mythology uh, behind everything, and that if you were drunk enough, you could explain everything. Uh, the most terrifying part for me was the guy who has to kill himself at infinitum uh, every like three seconds for the rest of eternity. Is there a story that you've told yourself behind that guy? Are you willing to share that story, or was it just so terrifying an idea that you had to do it? The three-second guy. I could send a whole lot of documents. Yeah, yeah. Just give us your email address. We'll send you a document that outlines everything. Um, so I hope people brought business cards. Yeah. We know, uh, uh, I'd rather keep that one in the mystery box, if that's OK. You can kind of intuit a lot of it from the, his surroundings. There's something we do a lot in all of our movies where, where often the camera just lingers on things in people's rooms, because it tells you who they are in a huge way. Um, and so you know that's, that's one reason why our production design is so spectacular, but also that tent kind of tells you what he was doing when it all went down, right? And, and where he was and kind of when he was. Um, but yes, there is an underlying mythology for actually everybody. And it's, it's shocking how much, especially in a movie like this, how much backstory comes into play for everybody. And luckily, even 
uh, the character of Tim, for example, the, uh, the the guy who dressed like he was from a like a Renaissance fair or something, and um, brewed the beer. Um, he has something like four lines in the whole movie, and we talked to him for hours and hours and hours. And that was his own request. That wasn't us just being like, "Hey, no, no, you're listening to us." He's like, "I got six lines," you know. But he yeah he wanted to like really really get in there. But um, but it's it shows in the weirdest little ways that you don't expect until they happen. Um, and uh, so yeah, myth mythology slash backstory of everything absolutely comes. Um, I was going to say full circle, but I don't want to be cheeky. So. <laughs> we got time for one more question. No, wait, oh. four more questions. Four more questions? I don't think so. Okay, one more question. One more question. <laughs> 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 Over there. <laughs> yeah, there was, you had your holding your hand up? Um, was there, aside from the logo, was there something hinky with the beer? Oh, something what? Uh, there's some questions of the beer. Yeah, because you're going to reference color out of space a little bit. So I'm thinking ergot fungus, beer, I don't know. The beer logo for the, 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 the or group? Or the beer in general. Or the beer in general, was there like a... Uh, is it full of drugs? Is it full of drugs? Is there anything... <laughs> going on with that beer that they're making. No, it can't be because they literally do, they do export it. Like they're not, they, like, look, they've got secrets, but they really are brewing that beer and exporting it. You know the scene where Justin's jogging? You know, and Justin's jogging and, and everyone like looks at him weird and there's a guy with the wraparound sunglasses? That's literally their import-export guys. Because those guys haven't submitted, they haven't conformed to, 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 to a loop, to this, this antagonist. So there's these people that can come and go. And in fact, in, I think we shot it, but in the original draft of the script, uh, Shitty Carl explains that he used to be an import-export guy, and that's how he just he got stuck in the loop. But um, but uh, the beer is totally normal. It's it delicious. It's amazing. Um, I mean, Tim has been working on it for like 300 years. Um, and uh, yeah, what's your problem with the beer? <laughs> uh, but 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 you bring up an interesting point that there's a lot of little things in the movie that. Because we're so all sort of indoctrinated with like pop culture ideas of cults, that okay, the smiling weird people are drinking something. Kool Aid. <laughs> it's you know you, your mind goes to poison Kool Aid, and uh, and like Hal walks out with a smile. You're thinking David Koresh, uh, and yeah, it's a it's an interesting thing. But no, if if you do find the beer in supermarkets, and sometimes 2018 is delicious. It's amazing. It's uh, Camp Arcadia beer. Aaron, that's a, sorry. Just speaking of beer, because you're about to shut us down. No, I have actually one last thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, do um, you plan to return to this world again? The Adventures of Shitty Carl, perhaps? Uh, man, I, I actually want to see The Adventures of Smiling Dave, to be really honest with you. <laughs> um, and that's, by the way, that's our producer, Dave, who hates being Smiling Dave. And we're like, you're Smiling Dave! And he's like, oh, I don't want to. He's like, you're Smiling Dave! Um, uh, and actually, we want to make him like the marketing campaign thing. So, no, I know. Well, that's the thing. We we want to say like like you know like, we keep on telling him we're like, smiling Dave, you're like the goat and the witch. You just put the goat on the poster, and that's and you sold the whole movie. We're just gonna put smiling Dave on. Dave's the goat, and Dave hates being the goat. Um, but uh, but yeah, uh, the the real answer is. Um, a lot of people have said that this would probably make a really good TV show, and that would be really cool to us. Um, that said, no one with money uh, has said that. Uh, if we were to the world with money, we we would probably need to sit on it for like another, honestly, like five years to to like see what else needs to be told. But yeah, I mean, it's still an open-ended universe for sure. Now, speaking of beer, speaking of beer, uh, since. Uh, uh, Mussolini over here is shutting down the, the Q and A. You know, um, <laughs> uh, we're gonna go to the office pub, and you guys should just mob us and and buy him drinks and uh, and make him tell you the whole mythology behind everything, uh, because uh, we're only here for like a couple nights and we want to spend some time. So that's it. Don't forget to vote for the film guys. Oh, and tweet about it, please. Do that. When's your release date? When's the release date for the film? Is it, is oh, March 23rd. March 23rd. So tell people about it, tweet about it, IMDb, letterbox it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very much.